Excellent. Thank you, Asma. And thank you to Alex for inviting me to join you today. I hope you've enjoyed your conference. I understand this is your last session and I may be standing between you and your weekend. So I apologize and I'll try to use your time wisely. Um, but I'm excited to be here today because I, I really enjoy speaking with folks that are outside of the United States because I learned so much from what's going on in other countries. I feel that in the United States, we've really had to self-organize to a great degree over the past decade when it comes to climate change and what does it look like to manage the situation as information institutions. So my goal here today is to share some uh, some of the work we've been doing here in the United States to uh, recognize the issue, help libraries self-organize around the topic, and really understand two sides of the story. Both, what does it take to be a resilient institution in the face of the impacts of climate change, but also how do we step up and play a role in the resilience of those we serve, whether it's a, a full community, a campus community, um, whatever type of institution that you find yourself in, we want to make sure libraries are relevant and responsive in the face of the realities of what our constituents are faced with when it comes to climate change. And climate change, uh, at least in the U.S., has been something that has been this for a long time felt like a slow moving disaster, but the pace has picked up greatly and people are experiencing more and more hot days and more severe weather and more frequent severe weather. So it's on more folks radar. Uh, we have to address this both as institutions to protect the assets and the information that we are charged with delivering to those folks that we serve, but also being a partner to our communities and our campuses to make sure that we are part of collective decision-making and solution generation so we can be uh, resilient in the face of what's happening. So my goal here today is to introduce some concepts, uh, share with you some of the stories from libraries that are in what's called our Sustainable Library Certification Program, connect you with a community of practice and some resources if you want to take a deeper dive, uh, and really just invite you to join um, the conversation and the community we've been creating here for the past 10 years around this topic. So to jump in, I'm, I'm just going to warn you, I'm going to start out and really bum you out. Um, but, uh, you know, back in 2020, during the pandemic, there were actually a lot of headlines in the newspapers with climate scientists trying to get our attention in the midst of that dire experience of the pandemic to help us understand that climate change was continuing to move forward and we were continuing not to quite meet the challenge in the moment and noted that in 2020, there really was a turning point in that for our professional lifespan, I don't know how long you have to go until retirement, but for the next 30 years, basically, we will experience more severe weather, more severe heat days, more severe activity on the coastlines of rising sea levels and eroding coastlines, disruption to food supplies, lack of biodiversity. And that's even if we do everything right to bring climate change to its knees. If we did everything the climate scientists have told us to do for decades and we did it right and we did it with urgency and we did it fast, we still would have 30 more years of contending with this increasingly dire impacts of climate change, which is really, de it's depressing, let's be honest. It's hard to wrap our heads around sometimes um, to think about the reality that we have created for ourselves and are now contending with moving forward. And so continuing to act like it will not impact us and the folks that we are serving is no longer an option. So when we think about what this increase has looked like over time, there's actually been a 78% increase in the amount of what we call billion dollar natural uh, disasters in the United States since the 1980s. We went from having severe disasters related to hurricanes, flooding, wildfires, once every 82 days in the 1980s. And in the 2020s, it's been once every 18 days. And that's been supercharged by climate change. So it's here and it's gonna stay for quite some time. In 2021, we saw the medical community have a call to action for the profession. Uh, and every single professional medical journal ran the same editorial in 2021. And just to you know put that context in place, that's during the pandemic during one of the most disruptive events of our lifetime, they put themselves out there and said that climate change is actually the number one threat to global public health, not the pandemic. And I think that contrast of understanding that in the midst of the pandemic was very eye-opening for many people. But this line really has stuck with me and I will admit I've lost sleep over it, understanding that climate change will negatively impact the health of every child alive today. And I would hazard a guess, I know Alex was smiling before we started our webinar this morning at his daughter who was having a lovely time 
playing this morning and thinking about those young people in our lives that we care so much about and wanting something better for them moving forward than what the current predictions are saying. And so embracing this idea that we all have a responsibility to address this topic, both through our personal lives and our professional lives is what we've been working on through the Sustainable Libraries Initiative in partnership with the American Library Association. So in 2022, the American Library Association issued their own call to action to our profession, noting that, look, the United Nations is trying to wake us up, telling us this is a code red for humanity. The medical community is saying this is the greatest threat to global health. We have to admit this is the grandest challenge of our time. Yes, even in the midst of here in the U.S., major censorship attempts, the effects of artificial intelligence, the concerns about politics and global politics across our globe, this has to be moved up in our priorities and planning for the future of libraries. So what does that look like? How do we do that? That's what we've been working on, creating resources, vocabulary, examples, things that can help libraries accelerate work in this area. Because what is absolutely clear is that no one is moving fast enough on this topic, and we have a lot of work to do. So in 2019, just to turn the clock back a little bit, the American Library Association expanded their core values list for the first time in almost two decades to include the concept of sustainability, to acknowledge the need for attention in this area in our profession, and to start giving us language that we can use to make better decisions moving forward. And I'll just say that, um, when we approached ALA about creating this core value, they had all but forgotten there was a list of core values. It had really, it was almost like a dusty page on their website that I found. And I said, why don't we upgrade this and really you speak to the realities of today? And they're like, okay. And I felt like I got one by them. Uh, but uh, earlier this year, they had a task force that actually took a closer look at this list of core values. They've winnowed it down from 12 to five, but sustainability is still on that list because we have a much better understanding of the importance of it in our profession. So in the resolution that made sustainability a core value, we defined it using a triple bottom line definition of sustainability because people were using the word sustainability in many different ways. And we wanted to contextualize it in the face of climate change and the impacts of climate change. And for those of you that know even a little bit about this topic, you know it's not just about the environment. It's about the choices we have made over hundreds of years that don't respect people and don't respect natural resources. So the idea behind sustainability in the American Library Association is to find balance amongst these three things, because we do have to confront the realities of our budgets and of our local and global communities, in addition to the environmental choices that we make on an everyday basis. So this idea is a framework, or perhaps you could say a lens, through which to make better decisions in all areas of our operation? Can we find better balance when we're buying office supplies, when we're thinking about how to cover books, when we are building new buildings, when we are measuring who we should have partnerships with across our, uh, our landscape that we work within? This is scalable. It can work for decisions large and small. And I'm not here to say that it's going to get you to perfect solutions, but I think it will spark progress in making better decisions for the future than perhaps we've made in the past. To not just think about, well, how much did that cost us in terms of dollars, but also thinking about how much did this cost us in terms of natural resources, in the burden placed on communities and the people who produce products or are part of supply chain. So as we think about our responsibility as global citizens to make better decisions, this becomes a framework to help us you know, make better decisions in the face of a very complex issue. We're talking about economics, social issues, uh, social uh, challenges that we've had for hundreds of years. We're not going to fix these overnight, but with deliberate attention to making stronger decisions moving forward, I think we can hold our heads higher, that we are making more ethical decisions to run our organizations and to design services and programs programs and partnerships moving forward. So this concept of collective impact is what we are trying to uh, create momentum behind. Because what I have found in my travels across the globe talking to people about this topic are everyone's in. We have a lot of good intentions, but we're often not organized within our own organizations, our associations and consortia, or our professional organizations. So really trying to find everyone's energy and pushing it towards the things that are going to have the most impact is what we are very interested in. Because I know in my own daily, my, my what I call my day job here at the Mid-Hudson Library System, I work with 66 public libraries every day. They all do amazing stuff. 
But when we focus our energy on one topic, like we did in the pandemic, we focused on the digital divide and making sure everyone could get online uh, and connect with the resources they needed to, that made a true impact in our communities. So we're looking to see how can we help us all in our profession organize and focus on the things that will matter most at the end of the day. So to that end, we're asking everyone to embrace the idea that no matter what your role is in your institution, that your job is now a climate job that you have a sphere of influence, you get to make decisions, you get to influence other people, and this should be part of our thinking moving forward when we have choices to make. Be that person in the room who asks, what's the carbon footprint of that choice? How many natural resources are we using by that? Is there a different way to do this? Is that product recyclable? Where is that gonna go at the end of its life? Do we really need that? So really asking people to think a little more deeply about some of the choices we make. We make a lot of choices every day, a lot of them for convenience, but what is the long-term impact of some of those choices that we're making? Now, I don't know about you, but I can get paralyzed by this level of thinking sometimes. Uh, you can definitely go down a rabbit hole and really start to go nuts trying to pick the right product or make the best possible decision. And again, we're not looking for perfection. We just would like deliberate thought being put into some of this stuff and understanding the impact we're having on a wider scale than just our budgets. Uh, we do a very good job, I think, recently of thinking about library workers in new ways, but we have to broaden our thinking to a more global mindset of our impact of our choices over time. So those areas that we'd like folks to focus in add up in this formula to what many people call climate action. Another phrase that I think we use very freely without always understanding if we're all talking about the same thing. So at the Sustainable Libraries Initiative, we have created what we call our formula for climate action, because again, it's a very complicated topic with many areas of activity. How do we focus our energy on the things that will matter most? And so we've focused our energy on three areas, climate change mitigation, which is basically the traditional reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, because that is what is fueling climate change. That's what's heating our earth and making our weather crazy and making glaciers melt and have our sea levels rise and making all sorts of other crazy stuff happen. That still has to happen, even though the climate scientists told us we're a little late to the game. So that work still needs to happen where we can make it happen. And we'll talk in a minute about the four key areas we could do work in to to do that. Secondarily, and at the exact same time, we have to be adapting in the face of what is happening here. We have to prepare our institutions for severe weather and climate hazards, as well as adjust in the face of what the climate scientists are telling us will be impacting us and those we serve in the future. And I brought some examples to show you here this today. But throughout all of those new decisions we are making to move forward in a, in a different way, we have to really understand that, honestly, the absolute most important thing we have to think about is actually, hopefully, the simplest, that we need to help more people have respect, understanding, and empathy for one another because we are all in this together and we have to work together to figure it out moving forward. And so understanding that many of the choices that we will be forced to make in the future do not always have justice at the heart of them for everyone. They may have justice for folks with a lot of money. They may have justice for folks that live in a certain geography, but we have to make sure we're understanding that we are not on an equal playing field when it comes to the present or the future. So making sure we're mindful of how what we are doing will impact others, but also being part of a conversation wherever you live, wherever you work, about how to get along better with our neighbors so that we understand each other and have respect for them so that we are all working together to find a way forward. And regardless of how well you do on the mitigation or adaptation end, that has to be at the heart of almost everything we do. So this is tangled up in very complicated issues, politics, economics, uh, history, uh, many biases we have about things in our world, the desire for convenience, right? It's a really, really messy thing. And it's a really big thing because we're talking about the whole planet and everyone on it and how we do everything. And so again, that can be overwhelming. It can actually form uh, some feelings of paralysis in the face of those things. 
And so that's what uh, colleagues of mine, we're all volunteers uh, here in New York State is where we got started. We thought to ourselves how frustrated we were that we saw no leadership from our association, our state library, and at that time, the government as well. No one was really talking about the realities of what we could see coming, right? People in the library profession are, are very smart. We read things. We can synthesize information. We can see what's happening. Why aren't we doing something? And I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but all of a sudden, a number of us looked at each other and said, well, we could do something. We could organize and try something new. And that's what where the Sustainable Libraries Initiative came from. A group of volunteers who said, we want to try something different and started to think, what would it take to catalyze action in the area of climate action in the library profession? And so for the past 10 years, we've been finding others who are interested in this topic. We've created resources and tools that I'll share with you here uh, and finding other people who wanted to try things and then start telling those stories so we can learn from each other and iterate on the success of others in our own environments. So again, I, I come here as a peer, as a colleague, and as a volunteer who just passionately believes that libraries are some of the key players in helping in a variety of sectors, good work happen with urgency. So what I did here next was just unpack those three components of the climate action formula to bring you examples of what does this look like, right? We talked about a lot of broad things, but let's get to specifics. What's practical? What does it look like? How do we talk about it? Because one of the things I like to acknowledge is that, again, library and educational folks are very, very smart. We're doing many of the right things already, but we are chronically humble. We do not always talk about what we do or why we do it in a way that people connect with to find that value. And so I'm not here to say that it's a PR campaign, but we do have to talk differently about some of the choices we make and be more, uh, I think, patient in explaining to people why we've made these choices so they understand our value alignment and how we are conducting uh, their business on behalf of them um, so they see the value and want to partner with us and perhaps even invest in us in new ways moving forward, which is what we're starting to see happen through our program. So starting with climate change mitigation, again, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, you may have a different experience than the next person in this webinar in terms of how much control you have in the workplace over influencing this area of your work. But I ask for your patience and open mind just to see what it looks like in different places. Some of you can influence your facilities, some of you cannot. Some of you do influence uh, transportation choices in terms of how people get to your institution or how products get to your institution. Some of you do not. Um, but for having the kind of patience to understand the four major areas that we can impact this particular topic are our facilities and how we use heating and cooling and renewable energy, transportation, how we get around, how our patrons get around, how stuff gets around, thinking through waste, how much waste we are generating that just sits around and pollutes our populations and our environment, and the emerging fourth area that library professionals and education professionals need to think about is the carbon footprint of our technology choices. Um, we've all, I think at this point, virtualized servers. We work in the cloud a lot. A lot of our products and our digital collections are growing and growing and growing, but understanding there is an environmental impact to a lot of those choices that we are making. I heard an interesting fact the other day for many of us, right, we are playing, and I saw um, earlier in your conference many sessions on artificial intelligence, and we are playing with those new interfaces to learn them and understand how we can use them and harness them for public good. Uh, but I learned an interesting fact, that if you use AI, a generative AI to create an image, say you're trying to find a funny image you want to create just to play with it, just creating one image takes enough electricity to do a full charge of a smartphone. Now think of the millions of images folks are playing with and how much electricity that is taking. Now I'm not saying don't try, don't play, don't learn, but I'm just saying let's be cognizant of the decisions that we're making and working with vendors who are taking seriously reducing the carbon footprint of the technology we are all using and harnessing for a better future. Now, getting back to some very, very basic things, we have a lot of folks in our program who do control their facilities and have been working to transition to renewable energy, which is the biggest area you can make a major change in. This is our uh, fiscal partner, the Suffolk County uh, Library Association. They've been working to transition to solar. 
Uh, they have solar on their rooftop. They have solar over the parking lot. And you can see this dramatic dip and how much electricity they are uh, buying and how much they are paying for. And you can see a little blip up because they installed electric vehicle charging stations because they are looking at different fronts of mitigating uh, climate change and thinking about transportation, also getting folks off of gasoline into electric vehicles and being part of the solution to create that electric vehicle charging infrastructure. So they have this holistic approach, but what their, what their board loves to see is they're paying less for electricity in a drastic, drastic way. So you can see they're saving a lot of money while doing good things for the environment. This is our first library that was ever certified in the program. Uh, and I point them out not only because they have solar panels, which is kind of okay, like lots of buildings have solar panels, but they've used that as an educational opportunity. So in the library, you can learn about solar, you can learn about why it's a good idea, you can learn about how much money is being saved and why it's good for the environment. And I show you this panel because it's right in the children's room, because the kids are fascinated with how it works and parents are learning. And then they're coupling that with programs that are helping people connect with making those better choices at home as well. San Diego County is our first library in California. Um, they are phenomenal. They actually just got certified last week. They have uh, many buildings, 33 buildings, but no new buildings are being built without being net energy zero and net zero energy for, sorry, net zero for water as well. They've transitioned their bookmobiles to electric vehicles and they have electric vehicle charging at every single location, demonstrating that we are the place you can come to get your car charged, which is a big deal in the adoption of that conversion to electric vehicles. This is our second academic library, Valencia College, that was certified. They've worked uh, very well with the campus sustainability officer, which we know not every campus has a sustainability officer, but they were able to partner with them. And the library has become the demonstration site for many of the energy efficiency applications the campus wants to do on a wider scale. Since the library identified themselves as open and interested in this topic, they've become the first building on campus to have the investments made, to have the new lighting installed, to have the new technology come in that is reducing the energy consumption of the entire campus. So they've become the model, the demonstration site. It's brought new money, new technology, and new respect to the libraries across their several campuses that they have in Florida. And I'll just point out that in the state of Florida here in the United States, the current governor does not allow, get this, doesn't allow anyone to have the phrase climate change as part of their goals in government funded entities. So this library has navigated that difficult political landscape uh, despite that kind of pushback from the state government that they are operating in. So again, excellent job they've done there. This is something I thought you might be interested in. You can, when I give you the slides, you can just click on this and you'll be able to download it. Um, but in Massachusetts, this is a library that wrote out a sustainability plan for itself in conjunction with its strategic plan. So they set goals for themselves for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, minimizing the amount of waste that's being produced through their library's operations. And you can just walk through and it sparks lots of ideas for other libraries and how you are operating. The Clarkson University Libraries here in New York, they've harnessed the power of their catalog to help with other applications across campus. This is just one of many examples in their final presentation. But at Clarkson, they you can actually use the library catalog where you'd be searching for uh, research topics and books and other items. That's where you actually book a bicycle to borrow, to ride across campus. Um, so they've harnessed the searchability of that catalog, the findability of resources, and have become a partner with their sustainability goals on campus by using what we're really good at, helping people find things and research things, but connecting them with a wider array of things uh, throughout what we might call our library collections. So really, uh, I think, cool example of how we can use what we're very good at for new ideas that come up on campus. This is uh, my last little story here about this topic of, of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. This is the uh, little Facebook uh, post here about Earth Day two years ago. Um, this is the county executive, so the top government official in the county of Suffolk County here in New York, announcing a multi-million dollar investment in electric vehicle charging infrastructure that he decided to co-locate at libraries. 
um, recognizing the popularity of libraries, but also acknowledging the leadership the libraries in this area have shown on the topic of sustainability. That's what rose their profile to make them a viable partner for this investment. So they're co-locating electric vehicle charging at the library so library patrons can use it during the day, county vehicles are charged at night. But in their remarks, they said, we're here today because the library is a leader on the topic of sustainability. So raising our profile on this topic is something that can draw attention, but also sometimes resources to achieve the things we'd like to. And from infrastructure improvements to uh, operational improvements or things we need to do differently in the future in a variety of areas in our services and programs. Now, climate change adaptation was the second aspect of that climate action formula. And this one is more complex depending on your geography, uh, your building, how you're delivering services, who you are serving. But the idea is to contribute to community resilience. How do we help our communities be resilient in the face of the climate change impacts that are predicted for your geography? Um, so this requires thinking on two different levels, which I'm going to break down for you here. But the very first thing we need to be very clear on is that what is a vulnerability for me here in New York may not be for Asma and Kuwait. Understanding the top regional vulnerabilities and designing to that, both in terms of uh, library or educational services delivery, but also in what our communities will be faced with and how do we help them be more resilient in the face of that. Those are the two faces of this work. So we're not asking everyone to design to everything on the list. We're asking you to pick the top two, three top vulnerabilities that could be impacting your area and then do some scenario planning. Think about when things get dire, how will that impact your ability to deliver services, how it will impact library workers, how it will impact those we serve to see what we might do differently or prepare for in new ways to make sure we are still at their side as they need us moving forward and we are thought of and seen as an asset in planning for resilience for those on our campuses and in our communities. So this two front adaptation uh, strategy that we're talking about, one is traditional disaster preparedness work, which there's lots of information about in our literature across our profession, right? Um, how to make sure we're preserving collections, uh, creating redundancies to uh, digital collections, making sure we know how to continue operations or get operations back up to speed pretty quickly if we're disrupted by a particular weather event, for example, um, and creating opportunities for our staff to make sure they can be prepared at home so they can show up and actually help in the aftermath of uh, a disaster that may befall our area. But newer thinking in the profession is how are we participating and partnering with those we serve to be more prepared as a community and being a part of conversations about preparedness. Uh, here in the U.S., it's called citizen preparedness. We have a whole program to help folks understand uh, what to have on hand, what supplies to have, uh, what communication alternatives there are if communications break down because infrastructure is interrupted or there's bad players at, at, at place. Uh, thinking about food security, we saw during the pandemic, food uh, security was rocked very fast. Uh, we saw people that did not have enough money to access food. We saw supply chains disrupted by the pandemic. We will see more instances of that moving forward. And making sure we're part of networks that help people connect with resources will be a growing role, I think, for libraries of all types moving forward. But again, that long-term commitment to equity, diversity, inclusion, access, and justice will be at the heart of everything we do. So honestly, if you take nothing away from this little webinar, uh, then that, that how are we helping neighbors be more neighborly? That would be one of the most important things for us to consider ourselves as being responsible for moving forward. Now, just a couple of examples for you. Um, this is the South Huntington Public Library, uh, and they've inspired a lot of work on academic libraries, which is why I brought this one uh, today. But they've been doing a lot of programs to help, uh, I think, manage people's fear around what may happen in the future, to connect them with first responders, and particularly help younger people in our communities feel empowered and more ownership over being prepared in the face of what is coming and to participate in more community building uh, ideas of how to move forward. They also invested in a whole building generator to make sure that if there is another extended power outage, as they experienced back in 2012 after Superstorm Sandy, that the library will be there for the community because their power 
war will be uninterrupted and they can continue to serve folks in the aftermath of a disaster. This is the Curtis Memorial Library. They've really focused on food literacy and eco-literacy in their community. And in fact, all of the landscaping on their property is actually edible, um, which is kind of a passive learning opportunity for people to understand where food comes from and what is native to where we live, which will more likely be uh, resilient in the face of the climate hazards we are all facing. This is another uh, food related uh, example that I brought you, but this is a, a very popular library tourist destination, if that makes sense to you. But this is a library that has a farm in the backyard. They use some of their property to create community supported agriculture. So you see these raised beds, half of them can be borrowed with your library card. So I can go in, use my library card, borrow one of these plots, grow my own fruits and vegetables for the season. And the other half are used for programming and learning and community supported agriculture where people learn how to grow, can, preserve. And then the food and the output from the gardens are given to local shelters and pantries for folks that might not have the wherewithal to buy fresh fruits and vegetables. So it's thinking about our collections, our programs, perhaps in a, a wider way, uh, thinking about our access to things in a new way. This is the program that's been super uh, popular in both public and academic libraries throughout the US, the Repair Cafe, which got its start in the Netherlands. They have a great toolkit for how to pull these off. But in my book, this is the best example of a sustainable program that folks really respond to while building community. The idea is having a cafe of experts, of folks that come in and teach you how to fix your stuff. So we're both learning from our neighbors, but also making sure less stuff is going into the landfill and having a good time while we're doing it. And the library is the host of this event. Uh, we worked with a uh, academic library in South Carolina. They call it the Fix It Clinic. And students come in and help people fix their technology, learn how to sew clothing, uh, how to uh, reuse uh, certain uh, materials they might have in their dorm rooms uh, so they don't just throw it out at the end of the semester. Uh, it really can work in a variety variety of situations, and it brings to the fore that whole idea of the triple bottom line. It addresses the humanity of that decision making and learning, uh, reducing our impact on the environment, and helping people save money ultimately, which is always a concern for students and folks in our communities. Now, my last little example here, this is here in my own system in the Mid-Hudson Library System. I mentioned I have uh, 66 libraries, but 17 of them are what we call library of local locations, where we have specialized collections on topics related to climate solutions, food security, uh, and coming up disaster preparedness. So each library has this special kiosk in their building. It has those books and movies. It specializes in programming related to those topics. And it also houses a seed collection and a tool lending library. So folks that are doing gardening or are helping with community gardening are finding the resources they need to do that work and come together through their library. Um, it's been wildly popular. I don't know if any of you have ever had this problem before, but the funder who gave me the money to do this literally called me yesterday asking me if I wanted more money. Like I didn't have to ask him, he came to me. Would you like more money? I'm like, yes, please, we can go further with this. So it's something that's brought new partners and new allies to work we do in libraries. And it's, you know, we've had books and, and resources on these topics forever, but we weren't known for it. So it's really trying to create that marketing footprint so more people connect with us and understand we are a partner in this work uh, and raising our visibility in our communities, which is part of the effort um, that we see to be successful in this area. That's how we accelerate to the, the speed necessary to be prepared in the face of what's coming. Now, one little tip I wanted to give you, um, there is this program here in the US that I, I checked. I'm pretty sure anyone across the globe could do this. It's an easy win um, to be a, a climate uh, resilience hub, which is just hosting one program a year to help educate folks about how they can be more prepared in the face of the climate hazards in your area. So it's an easy way to uh, both connect with the people that you serve, be seen as a resource and get some recognition uh, for doing that work as well. Now, briefly talking about climate justice, because we could have spent the entire time together today talking about climate justice. Um, the idea here is thinking about equity, how do we create equitable futures in the face of needing to make different decisions? And how do we consider all life experiences, not just those that are making decisions at the policy level or perhaps even the local community level? 
And I do highly recommend this book. And you may be familiar with the author, Eric Kleinenberg. He wrote, uh, I think most librarians, one of our favorite books called Palaces for the People, talking about the importance of libraries as social infrastructure and how key we are to building community across campuses and communities. But his first research published was this book, Heat Wave, talking about a heat wave in the city of Chicago. And what the outcomes were, depending on how socially connected communities were in the face of this heat wave. Now, extended heat waves are predicted to get far worse in the coming years. And it is actually predicted to be the number one cause of climate change related death across the globe. Uh, the United Nations estimates an additional 250,000 people a year will be perishing because of extended heat waves. It is the biggest threat globally when we talk about climate change. So it's very relevant research. But the book itself talks about his findings across different neighborhoods in Chicago, noting that those communities where people were more close together, they knew each other, they knew who lived alone, they knew who didn't have air conditioning, they cared enough to check on each other, they had a higher survivability rate in the face of this heat wave than the wealthier communities where folks were disconnected from each other and were isolated because they were self-sufficient in many ways because of the finances they had to spend on homes and large properties and air conditioning, something as basic as air conditioning. So it's a great lesson to understand that no matter how many resources a community may have, the human capital of people being connected to each other and caring about one another is really the special and key ingredient to climate justice moving forward. So I bring this to you, and this again is a topic we could have done a whole webinar on, but this idea of social cohesion and civic participation, this is an element of being a sustainable library moving forward. So getting people active and engaged, having a shared sense of purpose to move forward, these are the types of experiences that we're all trying to create so communities can work together better in the face of what is coming. Now, just real quickly, I'm going to wrap this up. I'm going to give you some resources, and then we'll have time for questions. But this is a really sad report that came out last year from the United States Surgeon General, noting that we actually have an epidemic of loneliness in our country. And helping people be more connected to each other is seen as absolutely critical, but also noting that libraries are a key player in helping that happen. So owning our role as a community asset and using that to our advantage in climate action work is absolutely part of what we're we're talking about. Now, Valencia College, I bring to you as an excellent example of a library that's holistically thinking about their environmental impact, their social impact, and the work of justice throughout this work. Um, you can see their final presentation for their certification on the Sustainable Libraries Initiative website, which I'm about to show you. Um, but so many good examples, just a grab bag of ideas that can get you thinking about your own environment and how we're participating, uh, both in traditional ways of perhaps devoting energy and resources into developing open access resources for those we serve to very, very practical things like lending out hotspots for folks that might not be able to afford them. Um, these are all little things that add up to the big work that needs to get done. Now, this is to acknowledge uh, we are talking about, honestly, a major mindset shift for many of us uh, in this work and that it will not happen overnight. It takes practice and deliberate focus. Um, but all you can do is start where you are today. Um, so if anyone's feeling guilty about how they got to work today or what they bought over the weekend, let go, just let go. All we can do is move forward here and really understand it's about the choices we make from this point forward and how we work together to make an impact for those we serve. So this is one of my favorite quotes. I have to remind myself of it frequently that I just, I can start where I am and use what I have and do what I can. And sometimes you get tired and you step back from it, but then you get re-energized when you find other people uh, like Alex here, who invited me to talk to you today. Um, so take your time, be kind to yourself, but do start making this a strategic priority moving forward. These are the characteristics we're looking for in what we call a sustainable library, that your policies and procedures and operations are ethical and authentic, that you're doing good work internally, so you're a good partner externally, that you do own the idea of helping with social cohesion and getting more people involved in problem solving in our communities, and not leaving to chance the idea of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and helping folks adapt in the face of what's coming. These are the four key areas of work that we see for libraries moving forward. 
Now you've got lots of resources uh, across uh, the profession. The Sustainable Libraries Initiative has worked on some specific resources for you. On the left is the roadmap to sustainability. You can download it onto your mobile phone or, or tablet, or you can download a PDF of it if you're like me and you like paper. Um, but it's a way to start organizing your thinking around this topic and everything you learn through this conference and maybe pulling it together through this lens of sustainability, cataloging what you're already doing, thinking about easy wins moving forward, who might be likely partners to do the work with you going forward. So it's an easy way to get started. Those of you that feel like we are so there already, our campus is super committed to this, you may want to take a look at the certification program we've developed. It was recognized by the International Federation of Library Associations, which is where we won that little award. Um, but it walks people through actions. So you practice using the triple bottom line throughout all aspects of library work. So there's an online interface, you walk through over 140 actions in these different areas. And the idea is lasting organizational and cultural change in our institutions. So we make better decisions all the time, even when champions like myself and my colleagues aren't around anymore. We're embedding better decision-making and policies and procedures and the ethos of our institutions. So this is the website, sustainablelibrariesinitiative.org. You can sign up for the newsletter, download the mobile app, come to our webinars, check out the resources, come join the Facebook and Instagram page and meet others who are doing good work. We do monthly uh, free webinars. You can get together and learn from each other. If you just want to come and listen, that's fine too. Um, I think it's a, that's the most important thing we've done over the 10 years is create this community of practice. And we invite you to join us. There's no cost. Just come on in. Uh, we really do just want to learn from more people moving forward and develop new resources for folks. Uh, coming out later this month will be the United States National Climate Action Strategy, which will create an implementation guide for many of the things we talked here today. So you may want to keep that on your radar to check out when it comes out. And I'll just end by saying uh, this is what I think about all the time. Um, these are a bunch of teenagers in one of my libraries. Two of them in the middle came in to one of my libraries and said, can we borrow the meeting room? Do we, can we book the meeting room? And the policy said that no one under 18 could book the meeting room. But the teen librarian said, well, I don't know. What, why do you want to book the meeting room? And they said, we want to make the world suck less. And she said, cool, that's what we do here. So she went to the director and she said, these two young women would like to use the meeting room. And he said, why? And she said, because they want to make the world suck less. And he said, cool, that's what we do here. And so they, with adult supervision, allowed the kids to borrow the meeting room. They signed over the teen programming budget to the kids, and they do community service projects based on the website dosomething.org to bring their vision to life of what the world would look like if we all work together better. And the library is the platform for them doing that. And I think that summarizes really well the potential of libraries, no matter what type of library we work in or what type of work we do, we're all trying to create the platform and provide resources for folks to shape a better future for us all. Um, so I thank you for your time and attention. Um, if you can't tell, I'm really passionate about this. I love talking to people about this topic and learning what folks are doing in other parts of the world. So I hope we connect. Um, I hope you're not shy about asking questions or reaching out and saying hi. But Alex and Asma, thank you so much for having me today. It really is a pleasure.